Thank you so much, Thomas. And thank you very much for your generous uh, uh, introduction. Um, can everyone hear me OK and <coughs> it's all good? OK. So uh, my talk today is on, as uh, Thomas introduced, on intracellular symbionts. And I think it really fits into the, uh, one of the key themes of uh, this, uh, uh, this meeting that intracellular symbionts are very widespread um, among uh, these uh, eukaryotes. And not only did they play a vital role in the early evolution of eukaryotes, but they're also widespread in all the major groups of eukaryotes. In other words, eukaryotes have it, this inordinate fondness for intracellular symbionts. Um, and that is really surprising, because it's like eukaryotes playing with fire, because these intracellular symbionts have enormous potential to do great harm to their eukaryotic host. And that's evident, and I'm going to give you three examples of intracellular symbionts that do untold uh, harm and m cause misery to our species. My first example is Mycobacterium, uh, the agent of TB, of tuberculosis, which is phagocytosed by macrophages in the lung, uh, some of these bacteria are trafficked to the lysosomes and destroyed, uh, but many of them stay viable within the macrophage and even reproduce. And they're sitting there in the intracellular condition in a uh, condition such that at some point they can actually cause disease. My second example is plasmodium, the agent of malaria. And that has an obligate intracellular phase in the erythrocytes of blood where they reproduce. And my third example is um, uh, an, intra, an obligate intracellular uh, parasite, uh, chlamydia, uh, which causes uh, particularly unpleasant sexually transmitted disease. So intracellular symbionts can do immense harm and damage. And that's hardly surprising. After all, an intracellular symbiont is an interloper coming into the very cells of a eukaryote. And it means that all their inputs, all the nutrients they require, come from that microbial cell and that, uh, sorry, from the host cell. And uh, the host cell is the sink for all their waste products. So it's very easy to see how this is a wonderful opportunity for an intracellular symbiont to exploit its host, competing for resources with the host, um, so reducing host cell growth and proliferation. And their waste products uh, represent causing perturbation to metabolism or other functions. And indeed, we now appreciate uh, in many, many intracellular uh, microorganisms ha have evolved effectors and uh, whose function is to perturb host metabolism or host functions for the benefit of this interloper. But of course, we equally know that uh, intracellular symbionts, not only do they exploit, but they can also cooperate. And in two particular ways, cooperate by acting as a sink themselves for host waste metabolites and for providing nutrients that the host can't synthesize and that's valuable for the host. And that's really what I want to focus on today. And I'm going to be concentrating on nutrient release by uh, microbial symbionts, cooperating microbial symbionts um, in just one group of eukaryotes, specifically insects of the order Hemiptera. And I want to explain to you why I'm doing that. Um, and why I'm working on this system, because it's not because I have an inordinate love for the order Hemiptera, but because they are a wonderful system to study symbiosis. And the reason comes in two parts. So I think of it as a paradox. And I'm going to start off thinking about plants and uh, remind you that plant phloem sap is uh, the medium for the long distance transport of photosynthetic products. So it is, phloem sap is nutrient rich, full of simple sugars and amino acids. And furthermore, it's a highly modified form of cytoplasm. And that means that although it can be chemically protected, there's limited opportunities because there's always the risk of autotoxicity to the plant itself. And so we would predict on the basis of this, 
that plants flown sap is a feast for any animal that's small enough and with piercing mouth parts <coughs> that it can penetrate through to the sieve elements of the vascular tissue of a plant. And that's where the paradox comes. Because if you look right across the animal kingdom, the only animals that feed on plant sap are insects, and specifically insects of the order Hemiptera. So I anticipate that some people here may not be familiar with the order Hemiptera. Um, they are insects that include uh, leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, white flies, aphids, psyllids, and so on. And the reason why I'm interested in them is that within this order, the ability to utilize phloem sap through the life cycle has evolved on a number of different occasions. And on every single occasion that we know about, it's associated with the ac evolution, the evolutionary acquisition of a symbiosis, usually intracellular bacteria. And on the several occasions where a phloem sap feeding lineage has given rise to a lineage that feeds on whole plant cells, those insects have promptly lost that symbiosis. So we have what is essentially a near perfect association. I hesitate to say perfect because nothing is perfect in biology, so I'll say near perfect. Association uh, between the presence of symbiotic microorganisms and phloem sap feeding. How could one study symbiosis and not work on the order Hemiptera? <coughs> so um, what I'd like to do in this slide is explain the functional basis of this association. And I'm going to tell you 10 years of my working life in one slide. So be kind to me. OK, so here's our microbial symbiont within our rectangular plant sap feeding insect. And you can see the microbial symbiont is overproducing and releasing essential amino acids. And uh, essential amino acids are the 10 amino acids that contribute to protein, but which animals as a group, um, and especially these hemiptera, cannot make themselves. Now, these essential amino acids are, uh, contribute about 50% of the amino acids in the protein of these insects, and that is roughly the same as you and me and other animals. What's important is that the plant phloem sap on which they're feeding Virtually all of the nitrogen is in the form of free amino acids. There are phloem mobile proteins, but in the great majority of plants, it represents a tiny proportion of the nitrogen in the phloem sap. Almost all of it is in form of free amino acids, and the percentage of that, those amino acids is much lower than in protein. And when we do the budget analyses, we find that, for example, a, a budget for the protein growth of an aphid there is plenty of nitrogen in the phloem sap, more than sufficient to meet their observed protein growth, but there is insufficient of many or all of the essential amino acids. And remember that an animal won't synthesize protein, won't grow, if there is a shortfall of any one of those essential amino acids. Okay? So it's, you could say it's a nitrogen quality problem, not a nitrogen quantity problem. And there are two main lines of evidence that, yes, indeed, these microbial symbionts are overproducing essential amino acids. The first comes from genomic data that the genomes of these symbionts code for most of the enzymes uh, required for essential amino acid biosynthesis. I want to make it clear that is necessary evidence, but it is certainly not sufficient. A great many bacteria can synthesize these amino acids. The really important thing is that these amino acids are overproduced and released to the host. And I think the key evidence that that is the case is that these isolated bacteria, and I don't mean isolated into long-term culture, I mean isolated analogous to isolating mitochondria or plastids. They're viable and metabolically active for a few hours. And during that period of time, they release essential amino acids, and it's highly specific. It's not a generalized leakiness. It is the amino acids that they're releasing. And we interpret that as a continu continuation of the trait they're displaying in, in the symbiosis, overproducing those uh, nutrients. So I'm going to talk today about two associ hemipteran associations. I'm going to be talking about the intracellular bacterium Buchner in aphids 
and another intracellular bacterium. They're both gamma proteobacteria, but they're different evolutionary origins in white flies. And as I mentioned, they're both intracellular and they're localized to specialized cells. We call them generically bacteriocytes, um, whose sole function appears to be to house and maintain these bacteria. And you can see this in Hong Wei's lovely fish micrograph. I hope you can see the red, which is the uh, fish of the Portiera in these cells in the body cavity, in the bacteriocytes, the insect cells housing them. And Simon's micrograph, again, a fish micrograph with the Buchner stained in green, packing the cytoplasm of these bacteriocytes, again, localized to the body cavity. Now, a key feature of these uh, associations is that they're invariably vertically transmitted and they're transmitted by being transferred to uh, the ovaries. And uh, you can see in Tom's micrograph here, the Buchner are stained in brown. And I hope at least the people at the front can see the outline of uh, the blastoderm embryo of uh, this aphid. And here are two maternal bacteriocytes with individual Buchner cells being transferred uh, into the blaster seal of the blastoderm embryo. And then as the embryonic bacteriocytes differentiate, uh, they incorporate the Buchner derived from the mother. It's a little different in white flies, and this is actually important um, because I'll be coming back to this right at the end of my talk. And again, uh, another of Hongwei's uh, lovely micrographs. Um, here is the, uh, one of the ovarials or egg tubes of the insect. Uh, the red is, is her staining for nuclei of, uh, of the uh, ovarial. And instead of individual portiera cells being transferred, in fact, the whole bacteriocyte is being transferred. Here, the portiera stained in green, and the bacteriocyte is transferred uh, to the ovary. And again, as I mentioned, I'll come back to that uh, later on. And another feature that's, of course, really relevant to our consideration of bacterial-derived organelles is that these bacteria have much reduced genomes. Uh, the Buchner are coccoid with a peptidoglycan cell wall, more on that later as well, with a genome size of just 0.64 of a megabase. And the Portiera have an even smaller genome size. Uh, they lack the capacity to make peptidoglycan, and you can see they're um, these strange pleomorphic structures within the cell of the cytoplasm. And this genome reduction, it's widely accepted, is we can attribute to a combination of relaxed selection on genes that aren't required in the insect. After all, these bacteria apparently have been transmitted in this way for 100 million years or more, and also to genomic decay, as a result of their um, obligate vertical transmission with a very small effective population size and resultant accumulation of deleterious mutations. So we were interested in the process, and still are, the processes <coughs> underlying the overproduction of these essential uh, uh, nutrients. And we argued that if we were going to understand those processes, we shouldn't just be uh, looking at and working on the back of an envelope to understand the function of these uh, metabolic uh, uh, enzymes, but instead reconstruct the metabolic networks and see what that is telling us about the metabolism. So starting with Buchner, um, we collated all the metabolism-related genes from the sequence genome and then we inferred from that uh, the number of reactions. So there were 196 metabolism-related genes from which we inferred 263 reactions and 240 metabolites, and we reconstructed the metabolic network. And in spite of that massive gene loss, it actually did more or less generate a, a single coherent net uh, network. And then we used, and we used predominantly flux balance analysis as a strategy to assess the flux through that metabolic network. Um, and flux balance analysis is a way of optimizing flux through a network um, to obtain a particular desired outcome or objective function. And the objective function that in most of our in silico experiments we use is indeed biomass production, but you can use something else. 
And we can use these metabolic models, um, firstly, to identify feasible solutions. And some of the solutions in the literature, based on just looking at the genes, aren't feasible. And that includes some of our published um, uh, solutions, as well as other people's. And also to construct precisely defined testable hypotheses, which, to a greater or lesser extent, we can then test. And I really want to make clear that our models are tools. They are not an end in themselves, because if our experimental data don't fit to our models, we change our models. Okay? So we go iteratively round this cycle, and it's much better than depending just on models or just on experimental data. So uh, this work started with my very good colleague, Gavin Thomas, based at the University of York. And I'm going to describe to you first one process by which overproduction of essential amino acids is promoted. And we call this pro process metabolic coupling, specifically metabolic coupling between a cooperative and a selfish metabolic pathway. And I'm going to illustrate this in relation to histidine production. Histidine is an essential amino acid which is overproduced. Uh, our best estimate is that about half of the histidine that's synthesized is transferred to the aphid. Now, as you can see, it's therefore a cooperative pathway. And as you can see, one of the intermediate steps in histidine biosynthesis generates a compound called ACAR as a side product. And it so happens that ACAR is also an intermediate in the synthesis of purines. Um, so purines are um, really important, of course, for the um, substrate for DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, ATP, all the things the Bokhra needs for its own growth and proliferation, therefore a selfish pathway. Now, this link is what we see for E. coli. And in E. coli, the flux through purine biosynthesis is several times greater than the flux through the to the synthesis of histidine. And the ACAR from histidine biosynthesis, pa biosynthetic pathway, is kind of a top up to the much greater, higher flux through uh, the, into the purine biosynthesis. Now, I've told you all of the, that about E. coli because in Buchner it's different. It's proximally truncated, specifically such that ACAR is the substrate. This means that in order to make enough purines to support their own growth, they have to overproduce, they have to increase the flux in the histidine biosynthetic pathway. Now, of course, you could argue that they could stop just here to make enough for purine, but then presumably there'd be an accumulation of uh, um, metabolic intermediates to uh, a toxic level. In other words, they have to overproduce histidine, they have to give in order to have enough purines to grow. By this metabolic coupling between um, uh, the cooperative and selfish pathways, the Buchner is coerced to cooperate. So when Gavin and I established this, and it was just about a decade ago, I started to think, well, we've done it. <laughs> There's nothing more to do. We, this is going to be the way that these cooperative associations work. Um, unfortunately, we have not got so far identified any other example of metabolic coupling between cooperative and selfish pathways. Um, the endosymbionts in ants display this exactly the same pattern, and it's probably because they, the two endosymbionts are derived from a common ancestor. Um, but this seems to be unique. But I'd love, if anyone knows of any other examples, I'd love to hear about it. What seems to be a much more general way in which, by which these bacteria overproduced comes from a, a different type of interaction. And this became evident to us initially when we just quantified the metabolic inputs and outputs to Buchner. And there are lots of them. They're all required and they represent a quarter of all the metabolites. For those of you who aren't metabolism people, the best way I can describe it is by saying this is the metabolic equivalent of being a chatterbox. Yeah? There are lots and it's a very dynamic interaction between the host and the Buchner. And 
a substantial proportion of these, this shuttling of metabolites between the two partners relates to what we call shared metabolic pathways. And I really want to discriminate here between metabolic coupling between metabolic, different metabolic pathways in the symbiont and shared metabolic pathways when I'm talking about processes operating across the two partners. I'd like to illustrate shared metabolic pathways with respect to four essential amino acids, um, the aromatic phenylalanine and the three branch chain amino acids, isoleucine, leucine and valine. And this is what we thought was going on before the genomics happened that these Buchner are synthesizing these essential amino acids and making it available to the insect. And this was very evident to us from comparisons between insects containing their Buchner and lacking Buchner and so on. And then we had what I now call our genome crisis. Uh, Shushi Shigenobu and colleagues uh, sequenced the uh, Buchner genome and it was evident that the terminal reactions in the biosynthesis of phenylalanine and the branch chain amino acids, it wasn't coded by Buchner. So here we had inescapable physiological evidence that these essential amino acids are being synthesized and inescapable genomic evidence that they can't be synthesized. And paradoxes in science are always good, it means there's something interesting going on. And our interpretation of that something interesting was something like this which was that the final terminal step was mediated by uh, enzymes coded on the aphid genome and by enzymes which are generally present across all animals. So I'm not talking about horizontal gene transfer. This isn't just animal uh, enzymes. Um, the, uh, the final step in the synthesis of phenylalanine by um, uh, uh, um, an amino transferase for which uh, the synthesis of phenylalanine is a side reaction. And in the case of the branch chain amino acids by the animal branch chain amino acid aminotransferase, which generally works as in animals in the first step in the degradation of branch chain amino acids, but is reversible. Really testing these hypotheses had to wait until we had the genome of the P aphid. Um, and we did the work on the P aphid, a surthosiphon genome, uh, a pesum. Um, it is so much easier to do RNA-seq if you have a reference genome. Um, it enabled us to do detailed proteomics and made it so much easier to do recombinant protein production and link this to our metabolism. And I'd like to show you now how we use that genomic information and um, basically our hypothesis was correct, I think. So this is work uh, that was done by uh, George in our lab and in collaboration with uh, Klaas in uh, plant sciences at Cornell uh, with his postdoc Anton. And um, this is the two uh, aphid enzymes, uh, GOT2 and BCAT, and we showed that both at the transcript level and at the protein level that they are enriched in the bactericide relative to the whole body. And we furthermore showed that these proteins are not transferred into the Buchner, they're retained within the bactericide in the host fraction, and they're not targeted to the Buchner cells. Um, the other key line of evidence was Callum's work, which was some metabolism, in which he dissected bactericides, I told you they're in the body cavity, he dissected them from more thousands of aphids than he or I would like to count. And then he likely homogenized the bactericides to break the cell membrane. And then by uh, centrifugation um, and a bit of washing, obtained an isolated Buchner preparation and the supernatant fraction, which is Buchner free bactericide. Um, we call it BF. Now, I mentioned earlier that the Buchner are viable and metabolically active. And yes, indeed, they continue to release essential amino acids. Here's phenylalanine, and these isolated Buchner released phenylalanine at a linear rate, quite a low rate. And when we added a, a drop of the Buchner free bactericide fraction, the rate of uh, uh, release increased significantly. But if we heat treated that fraction before adding it to the Buchner prep, 
uh, we uh, lost that effect. And we interpreted these data as the, um, uh, the addition of uh, the aphid uh, got uh, uh, transaminase uh, enzyme. And we realized that, or recognized, interpreted this uh, low rates of synthesis as just contamination of our isolated Buchner. Um, we couldn't get the Buchner completely free of aphid proteins, and our isolated Buchner were indeed contaminated with GOT2, and we demonstrated that uh, using uh, Western blots with antiserum that we raised against uh, the aphid GOT2. Furthermore, when we generated the recombinant enzyme, we found that we could replicate exactly the same pattern as for adding the Buchner free bactericide fraction. And we got the same pattern of results in relation to uh, BCAT enzyme and uh, the production of flucine. So what we think is going on on the basis of these various lines of evidence is that the terminal reaction is mediated in the bactericide by the host enzymes. And we know from other data uh, that we've collected that these essential amino acids are, of course, incorporated into the aphid proteins. And they're incorporated into the Buchner proteins because Buchner needs these essential amino acids that they now cannot synthesize um, for their own protein synthesis. And in this way, we have host compensation for the loss of those two enzymes, of the genes coding those two terminal reactions in the Buchner. But importantly, in addition to that, we have transfer over the con uh, the control over the fate of these essential amino acids from the Buchner to the host. No longer can the Buchner make those essential amino acids and decide how much to keep for themselves and how much to give to the host. Rather more, the host has control and can decide how much to give uh, to keep for themselves for their own protein synthesis and how much to give back to Buchner. In other words, the Buchner is really caught over a barrel here. Um, it has to synthesize an excess of this carbon skeleton. The host can't do any of these reactions. Uh, for the synthesis of the branch chain amino acids and for phenylalanine, in order to get sufficient of the final amino acids back for their own uh, proliferation, uh, protein synthesis and growth. And it's exactly the same as um, that metabolic coupling that the Buchner has to give. It has to give all this expensive carbon um, in order to grow. They are coerced to cooperate. What about white flies? This is a separate evolutionary association, and the genome of the Portiera is even smaller than that of uh, the Buchner. Um, this is work conducted by Jumbo in the lab, who um, reannotated the uh, published uh, genome of Portiera and identified some 95 metabolism genes, about half of which are involved in amino acid biosynthesis. And on the basis of his good work, uh, Nana in the lab, in collaboration with Brandon, uh, based at the Cornell Center for Advanced Computing, uh, reconstructed the metabolic network. You can see how tiny it is. It's crazy. Just 95 genes, 144 metabolites, and 82 reactions. And you can also see instantly that it is really rather a fragmented network. It's quite clear that there are shared metabolic, from interpre our interpretation from the genes that were missing as well as those that were present, um, that um, it was an incomplete for the uh, uh, genetic capacity to synthesize eight of the ten essential amino acids, five of which are convergent with Buchner. But there were three additional ones, and I'm just going to illustrate with respect to lysine um, uh, how uh, these additional uh, ways in which the uh, uh, metabolic uh, pathways are shared uh, between the host and, uh, in this case, the Portiera. So I want you to focus on the right-hand side of this blue bar to consider the Portiera and their capacity for lysine synthesis. And you can see immediately that they're missing the two terminal reactions. And the Portiera 
Also, DAC B sequence looks pretty scrambled, as if it's a pseudogene, and indeed we got no evidence for transcription. In addition to this analysis of the genome sequence of Portiera, um, Jumbo uh, conducted an RNA seq on the uh, the bacteria sites, and he identified very high abundance of transcripts for three genes, DAP-B, DAP-F, and LYSE-A, and no evidence for transcripts of any of the other genes uh, that are in the lysine biosynthetic pathway. Now, these data by rights are crazy because animals don't have these genes. The genes, I'm sorry, there we go, uh, the genes um, can be assigned with high confidence to bacteria and notice to three different groups of bacteria for each of the genes and they are not related to the Portiera in the, in the insect. So they come from different bacteria from the current symbiont. And it was very fortunate that at as the time that we were doing this work, we were also involved in the uh, genome project for this particular white fly. It's actually Bermizia tabachi in collaboration with uh, Shang Jun Fei at the Boyce Thompson Institute on Cornell campus. And uh, Shang Jun and Wenbo working with him were able to demonstrate unambiguously that uh, these three genes are indeed uh, on the white fly genome. So it is a undoubtedly horizontal gene transfer of these different bacterial genes complementing and um, generating this um, uh, shared metabolic pathway. So Nana has started to do some metabolic modeling of this system and he very quickly discovered that actually getting good flux distributions through the isolated Portiera network was tough. Um, largely because it's such a fragment, it's so small and so fragmented. And so he uh, um, uh, linked it to the bacteriocyte uh, metabolic uh, network that he generated from the transcriptome. And now I need, biology is always complicated. Um, it, there was another thing we needed to take into account, which is that the bacteriocytes, the insect cells containing the Portiera, always contain another bacterium. And that other bacterium is called Hamiltonella. Oh my goodness, that was fast. There we go. And so he reconstructed a three compartment metabolic network, uh, incorporating all three of these individual networks, which he connected by transport functions. And he took into account the relative abundance of the Hamiltonella and Portiera. And his final multi-compartment network, looks like that. And it looks like a hairball, doesn't it? Um, but it really does fire and it really does function in a way that the isolated Portiera network could not. We've done a lot of work on this, uh, in silico work on this network. Um, it was published last year in the Journal of Bacteriology. And I want to emphasize just one point um, for symbiosis people. And this relates to the genomic evidence that Hamiltonella can synthesize two of the 10 essential amino acids, threonine and lysine. And we have good colleagues who have interpreted this as evidence that the Hamiltonella are providing ly supplementary lysine and threonine to the host. So we decided to check this using our metabolic models. Now, lysine and threonine are um, both in the aspartate biosynthetic pathway, that is, they're derived from aspartate. And you can see that in our metabolic models, they're being synthesized. But however we managed the networks, we could not persuade our Hamiltonella in silico to overproduce either of these amino acids. They were so embedded in so many different parts of the metabolic network that all of it in silico was incorporated into the biomass reaction, into biomass production and growth. However, when Nana, instead of having an endogenous source of aspartate synthesized by the Hamiltonella, provided exogenous aspartate, it released lysine production 
such that it could overproduce, and overproduce at pretty high rates. Under no conditions has he been able to get threonine to overproduce in silica. So we have a picture like this, where the portiera, it cannot make its own aspartate. All the aspartate that is the um, substrate for the production of lysine and threonine comes from the host, and they overproduce such that 80% of these amino acids go back to the host, and the Hamiltonella overproduces quite substantially um, when provided with as much aspartate, uh, overprovided with aspartate from the host. I have to emphasize this is just a model, and we are currently working on ways to test that model. But accepting that it's just a model, I think there are two important things to emerge from this. The first is the limitation of inferring metabolic function from gene content alone. From gene content, it was really easy to infer that the Hamiltonella represents an important source of lysine and threonine. Um, it, our models do not indicate that it's important for threonine at all. The second point was that here we have a route for host, another route for host control over nutrient overproduction by the supply of aspartate. Um, that when the host is providing aspartate, we get this lysine overproduction. And we know for these associations, whether it's Buchner or, or Portiera, that they scale their production of these amino acids to host demand. They're incredibly cooperative. If you put these insects on a diet with sufficient of an essential amino acid, the production of that amino acid by the microorganism drops right down. If you put them on a diet with little or nothing of that essential amino acid, it goes up. And this is achieved with minimal change in transcrip transcription weights. It appears to <coughs> operate entirely, indeed, I'm sorry, not just transcription, but also protein. We've published all those null results. Um, it, it seems to operate entirely at the level of the metabolic network. And we think that substrate supply from the host is really important. And our best line of evidence comes again from work conducted by Callum, in this case on the aphid system, and this is yet another essential amino acid we've been working on, methionine. A methionine biosynthesis is um, it, it's a shared metabolic pathway again, but in this case, it's shared with uh, the uh, aphid. Uh, it's proximally truncated in the Bochner as such that the aphid makes the uh, homocysteine and uh, the, the Bochner mediates the fi very final step. So our first hypothesis was that Buchner would do it like E. coli, since Buchner is quite closely related to E. coli, and that is by product inhibition. In other words, if we have substrate to product, the product inhibits its own synthesis. In other words, it w another way of thinking about it is to think of it as pull metabolism. That is, if there's not enough methionine, that kind of pulls the flux from cystothionine to methionine. And we would predict, therefore, that if we um, rear our aphids on diets either containing methionine, that is our standard diet S, or on a methionine-free diet, M0, we would expect reduced levels of methionine in the bacteriocytes of aphids on the methionine-free me uh, diet, a pull metabolism. And you can see instantly we get the exact reverse of that prediction. No. OK, so the other alternative is that it's uh, controlled by substrate supply. That is, the substrate um, the availability of substrates sort of pushes the metabolism through that metabolic pathway. And if that were the case, we would expect on the methionine-free diet, the bacteriocytes would have high levels of the cystothionine. There we go. Elevated in the bacteriocyte. And notice that it's not evident at the whole body level in either case. Also, as a supplementary analysis, um, uh, Callum uh, isolated his Buchner and quantified methionine release. And he found that methionine release depended on adding cystothionine to the basal medium and that it was actually released at a higher rate when the cystothionine was equivalent to the concentration in the bacteriocytes on the methionine-free diet versus the standard diet. 
So I think altogether, this suggests that substrate supply plays a really important role in determining the uh, rate of synthesis of these essential amino acids. And our current vision of this is that the bacterial symbionts are poised for some maximal rate of release. They have all the machinery in place to release up to some certain point, and the realized rate of release is dis determined by substrate supply from the insect. And this enables the insect to have really exquisite control over the provisioning of essential amino acids uh, from the symbionts, both over time and also spatially. Um, and that's one of the key hypotheses that we're working on at present. I'd like to just, I think I have time to finish off with two very brief stories. Um, the first one um, is a reminder to you that uh, the hemiptera includes some really devastating agricultural pests, some of which are globally important. Um, and this is partly through direct damage to the plant, but also because they transmit plant disease. And one example that we're involved on in is actually a Gates-funded project on uh, the whitefly uh, Bermisia um, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where it forms superabundant populations on one of the staple crops, cassava, and can cause devastating loss to those crops, which you can measure in uh, billions of dollars, but much more. We should be measuring it in terms of hunger and social dislocation, when you uh, collect your cassava crop and it looks like this. There's no cassava at all. Um, another example is a highly invasive psyllid um, that those of us from the US are familiar with, the Asian citrus psyllid, uh, which has come into Florida. It transmits a bacterial disease um, which is devastating the citrus industry in Florida. You can see the uh, production of oranges has been more than halved and the prognosis for the great Florida orange is not good, um, courtesy of this uh, insect. Now, these globally important insect pests are totally dependent on exquisitely fragile symbionts. And the reason why I say this comes from our metabolic modeling. We took the metabolic model of, um, of Buchner and of Portiera and we systematically eliminated each one of those metabolism genes in turn and scored the observed growth relative to the wild type, all in silico, of course. And you can see that more than 80% of the genes in Buchner, if you eliminate any one of those genes, there's no growth. And for Portiera, it's more than 90%. And so if you disturb any one of these genes, apart from these few here, um, there is so little redundancy that the, the, ins uh, the bacterium won't grow, the symbiosis will collapse, and we will no longer have a problem with psyllids in Florida or white flies in sub-Saharan Africa. That's the vision. Um, we are really beginning to make progress with this, and I promise you this has been a long and, and very winding and, and fairly bumpy road. And um, the first uh, genes that we've been working on are two horizontally acquired genes in the aphid genome, uh, AMI-D and LDCA, uh, which are involved in uh, cell wall by uh, peptidoglycan uh, um, uh, uh, breakdown. They're both of alpha proteobacterial origin, and as you can see, they're highly enriched, particularly at the protein level, in the bacteriocytes relative to the whole body. Um, they mediate uh, the um, cleavage, the breakdown of the monomeric unit of peptidoglycan. Uh, the amidase breaks off the peptide from uh, the glycan, and then uh, the carb uh, carboxypeptidase, the LDCA, then uh, cuts, cleaves the uh, terminal D alanine. This is important for two reasons. Um, the first is that um, this monomeric unit of peptidoglycan is a very potent activator of the immune systems of animals generally. And secondly, we expect it to be produced at high rates in the Buchner because the Buchner can make peptidoglycan. Do you remember I mentioned that right at the beginning? And they can mediate the first transglucose uh, 
uh, glucosylase step in the turnover of peptidic glycan, but they are lacking all the genes in uh, the recycling of peptidic glycan. In other words, they're just as the, the cell wall is remodeled and as the Buchnera grow, um, the, uh, they are spewing out this highly immunogenic molecule. And we argue that these horizontally, uh, the proteins from these horizontally acquired genes are actually, you might say, removing the evidence that the bacteria are there. And so we argued that um, if we um, suppress uh, these, uh, the production of these enzymes, then uh, we may activate the immune system of uh, the insect. Well, we certainly haven't actually tested that hypothesis fully, but we've made, I think, good progress. And this is work, in fact, it was published just last week um, uh, with Chung Pen and Sung Ho as uh, the two co-first authors. And we used RNAi, orally delivered, um, it has to be orally delivered if it's going to be of any use in pest control. We're not going to go around injecting every insect in our field of cassava or Florida uh, orange trees. Um, we get, um, we, so far we've been able to reduce gene expression by about 50%. This is a very long story and you're very welcome to look at this paper to see all the difficult detail. Um, but the bottom line for our purposes today is that we have reduction in uh, growth rate of our insects. And this is associated with uh, reduction in the abundance of our Buchnera uh, by about 30% as quantified uh, by the abundance of the ribosomal RNA gene. And I think even more encouragingly is uh, a further reduction in the activity of the Buchner as measured by the relative abundance of the ribosomal RNA versus the ribosomal RNA gene. We're right at the very beginning of this story, of that I am sure. Um, but to my knowledge, this is the first time that anyone has been able to specifically target the function of an intracellular symbiont of this sort for insect pest control. And if I'm wrong, do please tell me, because I shouldn't say we're first if we aren't. I have one other very quick story. And my reason for telling you this story is that we should always expect the unexpected. And this unexpected is one that I keep on pinching myself because I can't believe it's true. And um, it's all about the bactericide. Now, I told you right at the beginning, if you recall, that in most of these associations, the bacteria are released from the ma maternal bactericide and then transferred to the ovaries and then are taken up by the differentiating bactericide of the embryo. In white flies, it's different. And I showed you Hong Wei's wonderful picture um, here where the whole bactericide goes to the ovary. And indeed, um, Jumbo was able to show a few years ago that when the female insect becomes adult, the bactericides separate out and they become motile. You put them on a glass side and I promise you they crawl along the grass slide. And um, they're highly pigmented, you can see it here, and we believe that they crawl around in the insect body to the ovaries where they squeeze their way in and a single bactericide becomes associated with the terminal egg of each ovarian or egg tube. We were interested to know what happens next to these bactericides. And the easiest way to explain it is a set of experiments that Junbo did. And essentially he took one male and one female from our routine whitefly culture. He let them mate and the female lay eggs, and then he cut their heads off. And the heads don't have bactericides. And he scored the microsatellite profile in the head of the female. She's diploid and heterozygote. Um, white flies are haplodiploid, males are haploid. And you can see that the, one of the female offspring, um, we have perfectly good, sensible inheritance for <coughs> one from uh, uh, allele from the male and one from the female, and he did the same over the next generation. Well, that's not why I told you those data. What he also did was to disembowel the females as well as decapitating, and he scored the microsatellite profile of the bactericides. 
The microsatellite profile of the bacteria site was different from that of the head of the same insect and didn't change over time. And we sequence those microsatellites, they are not Portiera gene uh, 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 sequence. He did this for 10 different crosses for each of five polymorphic loci, and he got us the same result. And we interpreted this as evidence for somatic inheritance of the bactericide. That is, the bactericide that goes to that egg <coughs> is incorporated into the egg and persists through embryonic development. And we were able to show microscopically that is indeed the case. It divides just before the birth of the insect, and the neonate insect has two bactericides. As another check for this, uh, Jumbo took two female insects and he disemboweled and decapitated them. Again, remember bactericides aren't in the head. And uh, he conducted a genome sequence. Um, we did the analysis of this with our good colleague, uh, Shang Jun Fei, with whom we'd done the original white fly uh, genome sequencing, and this with uh, Chu Peng in his lab. Um, and we focused on the homozygous biallelic SNPs for analysis because we were particularly concerned that we could have contamination of our bacteria sites with um, other cells of the insect body. Um, Jumbo is amazing, but even he can get his bacteria sites slightly contaminated. And by working with homozygotes, I think we dealt with that problem. And here is the mid-rooted maximum likelihood tree the bacteria sites from our two different insects were more closely related to each other than each was to the head of the same insect. We are very aware that we have violated Weissmann's doctrine of the continuity of the germline, where there is an immortal germline and a somat uh, somatic tissue which doesn't go from one generation to another. We have lots of unanswered questions and I'm desperately trying to get money to answer those questions. Um, about the antiquity of this, we believe, asexual bactericide. Maybe I should have written asexual question mark bactericide lineage. M we just don't have the data. And we're very aware that we have sequenced divergence between the genes in the bactericide and the sexual lineage, but our genome coverage wasn't sufficiently good for us to say with any confidence whether there is a difference in gene content that we've had differential loss between the sexual lineage and the bactericide lineage. And of course, that question is linked to that question. So I'd just like to finish off, and I'm, I have just two slides. And the first is just to remind you of really the main take home message of what I'm trying to say, that intracellular symbioses are part of the way of life of eukaryotes, um, and that all eukaryotic cells are the product um, and I'm going to emphasize, because I'm me, metabolic coevolution with intracellular symbionts. And I think our work with aphids and whiteflies illustrates some of the patterns of how that metabolic coevolution may work. But I'm also very aware, and I hope this may be useful as we go forward to some of our breakout groups, um, of some apparent differences between bacterial derived organelles and the only intracellular symbionts that I imagine I know anything about, um, and that is in insects, where there is massive protein targeting to the organelle in our bacterial derived organelles, but symbiont function appears to be supported predominantly, if not exclusively, by metabolite exchange um, in uh, our uh, insect symbionts. Horizontal gene transfer is important in both cases, for the organelles, it appears to be from predominantly from the ancestor of the organelle to the host, but do correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it is not from the current symbiont in the case of our insect systems. And finally, and this is um, a difference which I, I feel progressively less confident as I go down here, it appears to be relatively rare or unique in the case of bacterial derived organelles, but it happens again and again and again um, in our insect systems <coughs> with various different kinds of microorganisms, which makes me wonder if we have conserved molecular circuits of one sort or another in our insects, and that would be something I'd love to uh, be able to study at some stage. Let me finish just by thanking our uh, funders, um, 
NSF and USDA, the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future, which really got our work on the whitefly RNA off the ground, without which nothing would have been possible in that area, the Gates, uh, Biocrop Science, who funded all our work on the AMI-D and LDCA, and also the um, Californian American Vineyard Foundation. I'd also like to thank so many people in the lab and that we collaborate with, um, but I particularly thank the, the real heroes in bold, uh, Nana and uh, Junbo, uh, Chung Feng and Sung Ho and Callum, uh, together with Brandon, Klaas and Anton, Chang Chung, Shang Jun, Chu Peng and Wenbo, and of course, uh, Gavin. And thank you very much. <laughs>